Hold on. You don't have a headset on. Welcome back to another episode of Smack Talk, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. You are tuning into 2015 Year in Tech Review. We are wrapping up 2015. My name is Brian Fanzo, better known as iSocialFans on the Twitters. Joined, as always, every Smack Talk episode of 2015 by my co-host, uh, Daniel Newman. How are you, Daniel? Brian, I'm doing great, and it's an amazing time to jump on and spend a little time doing a podcast that we haven't forgotten about, but we've just been a little busy. And after what, it was about 40 weeks or so of being very consistent and doing exactly what they say podcasters must do to be successful at podcasting, we sort of fell off the wagon a little bit for the last uh, couple of months. We fumbled, yes. And now we're trying to pick up the ball here, and we're going to try to wrap up the year get next year started and then hopefully do a much better job in 2016 because we have a lot of people actually asking what happened and where have you guys been so we have been around we are going nowhere and we will be back in full effect in 2016. Yeah, so for all of those that have been hitting the refresh button on your podcasting app, uh, app and going, there must be something broke. No, there's nothing anything broke. There's been this wild world of no excuses. We have no excuse. So um, I, I'm excited to do uh, get back into the every week uh, flow. We actually have uh, looks like we have a, a new sponsor lined up for the the start of 2016 as well. So we'll we'll be adding some new sponsors, adding some new voices, um, and really, we, you know, we record the show every single week on Blab, or we will be recording it every week on Blab. And I, I love, you know, bringing in our audience. We have an audience now, you know, up to 32 people have come in already. So we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to make sure that we get some links out to you for those of you that are, um, you know, want to join on a regular basis and even participate in the, um, in the comments section. And, and I, I, who knows, throw some people on air with you. And so you can get in touch with our podcast, um, you know, our, our podcast audience. And, and Daniel, it was, you know, 2015 was a crazy year. And, and just before we went on air, I told you, I was like, you know, I was going through the smack talk pictures that I had. And, um, the one that I, that I came out and just jumped out at me, the very first picture was actually, um, when you and I recorded, uh, episodes in Barcelona, Spain for Mobile World Congress, which was um, the end of February, early March timeframe. But really, you know, the year kicked off, uh, of course, in January. For those of you that understand a, a monthly calendar, it's, the year starts in January. Um, but, you know, I, I think when we're starting to recap the year in tech, you know, it's hard for me to rem start thinking back, like where things started. You know, I, I immediately go to live streaming because I, I think there's like pre meerkat and then post meerkat um because meerkat had such a big tech impact on me but i think I'm, we're going to talk way beyond um just live streaming you know on this show the reason that you know daniel when you and i were coming together for this um to start this show everybody told us and everything i read and every event i went to they said in podcasting you have to be niche focused you must be niche focused, pick a small niche, hit a home run with it. Well, guess what? Um, Daniel, you and I are generalists. Um, we don't do very well in direct niche focus. So we created a podcast called Smack Talk, which stands for social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. And really it's social media, social business. We talk analytics. We talk big data. Uh, when we talk cloud computing, sometimes we go in the data center space sometimes. So we really went after a tech podcast that was the opposite of niche. <laughs> um, so, you know, Daniel, when, the, when you start thinking back at 2015, what's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for you when you're thinking tech review, where were you at a year from, you know, this show, um, you know, let's say late December of 2014. And kind of, if we were, if we were previewing 24 or 2015, what were some of the things that you thought we were, were going to be excited about and how did those kind of mix in? Yeah. There? You know, for me, I was, I was super focused on two things that became sort of underlying topics in our uh, 2015 shows, both cloud talk and smack talk. But one, I was really thinking 2015 was going to be the year of remote work and mobility. Um, you know, I had so much belief that we were going to start heading down this path that companies were going to get more distributed. And this is really based on the mobility piece for me was really based a lot upon collaboration, which as we've seen, and it's been, like I said, a kind of an underlying theme of every show we've done is that the power of collaboration was going to explode in 2015. And by explode, what I really mean by that is it's going from something that only enterprises could do to something that thanks to mobile, thanks to apps, thanks to tools like Blab and Slack and things that we like to use every day are really becoming something that we as a small business, as a solopreneur can now do. We can connect, collaborate, communicate, partner with people around the world. Think about this show. I mean, we've already been to Italy and back. 
And that's just in the first uh, few minutes here of our, our year in review. So, you know, I really saw it coming. And I would say that uh, that prediction, while not not all that forward, certainly doesn't make me a futurist to say that we would be getting better at mobile and collaboration. I think this was a year that it really did start to explode and it really did become something that all companies could start to get more flexible and more remote with the way they engage and work with their employees. Well, you know, and I think that actually became, you know, it started to become a, you know, a small business or medium sized business um, oftentimes can embrace some of these trends, mainly because if you think about it, it's like, wait a second, I'm going to have my people work at home. I have less overhead. Um, they probably end up working more hours because they are at home. Um, you have to trust people when you're a small business or a startup. You have no option, right? You have, you're like, I hire you. You're going to, I have to trust you. You know, and I, I like to say one of my things that I really love to, you know, think about is, the distance between that that entry level employee and the CEO, right? And the reason that I feel that small, medium sized business are be able to so nimble and make some of these decisions is really trust, right? Because the the distance between the CEO and that new hire, oftentimes the CEO is not only involved in the process but probably has the final say. Where you get into an enterprise, oftentimes the not only does the CEO have no idea who they're hiring, they couldn't even tell you how many how many new hires they have um, a week or a month. And I think that's an interesting trend and. You know, I, I think for me, you know, Daniel, we couldn't start, start off a year in review without covering the three T's, right? So the three T's of trust, training, and tools, although a staple in our cloud talk show every single week, um, they've been a staple on the smack talk as well. And those that are tuning in, maybe it's your first time listening to our show. You know, Daniel and I are both super tech geeks, right? I mean, Daniel, I mean, you have an Apple Watch. We both live on the Apple bandwagon. We also love Android products. You have a new Samsung device. I would love to hear. Maybe we're going to have to do a show about that in early 2016 on how you're embracing a, a new uh, a new tablet with a new operating system. But for me, something that really kind of stands out to me in 2015 is that you know you and I hold, host a show every Thursday at noon called Cloud Talk. It's a very small, it's a niche. I said we don't do a very good job in niching. We niched out on that podcast, and it's without question our most successful media of 2015. And I actually put this back on you, Daniel. We, we had a bunch of media shows. We had a bunch of things going on. There's no way I thought a cloud computing conversation on Twitter, which is really hard to find influencers or people that are actually having that conversation, would be our most successful show and probably our most talked about uh, piece of content that you and I create from a, a show perspective when it was cloud computing. I mean, a year ago, I believe we were still looking at the sky when people were talking cloud computing. Small and medium-sized businesses said, hey, I'm doing cloud computing. I have box.com or I have Dropbox or um, you know, someone sold me something that had the word cloud in it. Yeah. So you know, I actually think one of the things, the biggest surprises, kind of like remote work, was I actually think 2015 went from the idea of that we were doing cloud to we're actually leveraging cloud solutions and benefits to actually be more productive and do things in our business. Now, I'm not saying we're all there, but I actually think now cloud is actually part of our solutions, not a one-off checkmark that we feel like we're doing. And if you would have asked me that a year from now, I would have said there is no way that in, by the end of 2015, cloud would have come as far as it has. And to me, that's probably... My, one of my most shocking a, things of this year. makes a big statement for you know business transformation digital transformation is that cloud has now become sort of uh, lack of better terms ubiquitous i know that's a little bit of a buzzword but with business it's not really about cloud and not really about tech you've got your trust training tools i always say tech is for solving business problems and i think that's exactly what's happened this year i also think uh 2015 was a year of something else and i think this will caveat really nicely into something i know you'll want to talk about with live streaming but it was really the year no you won't want to talk about that it was really the year of brand storytelling becoming less of a of a buzzword amongst marketers and really became something that was driven by consumer and customer experiences that they want brands to tell stories and they want authentic they want people that aren't necessarily brand people to tell them and you started kind of going into this about how our cloud talk show took uh, hold. But I was thinking about this and you can talk about this too, Brian, but you know, in the last year, you know, you and I have worked with, we worked with Dell, we worked with SAP, Oracle, Rico, HP, um, IBM, you know, who else am I missing here? I mean, we have worked with uh, Samsung. I just got more Samsung gears. I mean, these brands and, and they're competitors, but they all want people like us, not necessarily us. And it's not just you and me, Brian, but people like us who are interested in technology, interested in business. We like to be on social, but more than anything, we like to tell stories through written content, through live streaming, 
through digital mediums, through video, through all kinds of different platforms. They want people who talk about it, not in a sales way, not in a pitch way. We've really entered the age where brands want people who are gen the community. They want genuine community people to be out there talking excitedly about the technology and the business solutions and the lifestyle solutions that their products solve. And I think we've really entered a year where that's starting to happen. And that's why shows like Smack Talk and Cloud Talk have been so successful and brought us to so many places around the world. Well, you know what? And I think, you know, uh, before I get into the live streaming aspect, I'm actually going to go a little bit into streaming. And I actually think I, I and maybe this is a blog post that I need to write uh, over the holidays, but I actually think Netflix might be the biggest catalyst for all of this tech change we saw in 2015. And no, Netflix wasn't new in 2015. And no, I don't think like their user numbers went up crazy or anything. I I'll have to do a little bit of a little bit of research on that side because you know we do talk a lot of data here and we want to make sure that we are backing our our facts with data. But I actually think of Netflix as this new not Let's not let's get off the millennial train because I believe it is a millennial mindset. And hopefully by the end of 2016, we're talking about something that's written in stone where I talk about this millennial mindset. But um, I actually think of it as we want we want our content. We want our experiences where we want them, when we want them how we want them. And not only do we want that, we want to consume it like immediately, right? Like, I mean, I remember Netflix, whenever I first signed up and they were giving those DVDs in the mail, I was like, this is cool. But then I was like, Friday night, oh wait, I have to wait for one in the mail. Like, okay, I'll go to Blockbuster. Well, we all know the story of Blockbuster. I think we use them as a, an amazing example in, in 2015. Maybe that's a, a goal of our 2016 preview show is that we don't bring up Blockbuster or Uber as examples anymore. Maybe we have these new companies that are pushing the, the good and the bad boundaries. But I actually think of Netflix transforming really this idea of personalization and the idea of, of hey, let's talk, you know, no one signs up for Netflix because they like the red logo app on their phone. What we like is we like to pick the content we want and we want to consume it when we want. We don't want to have to go change our life like the TV does, right? Like the reason that we all, you know, before TiVo, Let's go back in the way back machine, right? And I'm, I'm gonna laugh on my kids. You know, Daniel, you and I both have have daughters. You know, when our daughters are like, "Wait, there was before TiVo. Wait, what is TiVo, Dad?" Because they don't even they know of on demand streaming services. But I actually think before TiVo, right? You the only way you consumed TV is you changed your entire life to get home at Thursday at 9 p.m. so you could watch CSI when CSI had just started. I remember, like, I had Survivor. I'm a reality TV junkie. I'm getting off a little tangent. But I'll I'll bring it back to this tech. Uh, review, but you know, I remember the idea of going home and making sure I watched Survivor, and then I watched CSI uh, Las Vegas. You know, which turned into three thousand CSIs. But I remember changing my my day, my life, disrupting and interrupting my life to consume content based on someone else's calendar, based on someone else's dictation. Well, guess what Netflix did? It just, it, it gave, I mean, the fact that we were on a plane, Daniel, you and I were on a plane to Barcelona, watching the content that we wanted to watch, not only not on our home, not only not on our TV, but doing it over the airplane Wi-Fi, doing it on Netflix, you know, like watching our content. So when I think when we started off the year, we were super excited for Google Hangouts. We were using Google Hangout Live. We were, I mean, we are crushing it on that. Um, we were doing a little bit of recording on Skype. And then we were like, you know what? We like the Google Hangout Live aspect. You know, we run the we run Cloud Talk um, on uh, with Google Hangouts. So we added video. You know, we were really on the on the. You know, I remember on Social Business Hour, the other show that I host. Um, you know, we we jumped video in there really early, and we were we were one of the. You know, I would I give the credit to CMGR Hangout as the initial one, and then we jumped on it really probably second of all of those shows. But I think when we started off the year, I don't really think I realized how important it was to give people content where they want it, how they want it, and the technology that comes out. Because I think Netflix and the combination of our cellular networks being powerful enough, and then the iPhone 6. And I know it, it's available on Android too, but the iPhone 6 actually finally gave us technology that the, the front camera and the back camera were, were, were good enough quality, not great, not perfect, not HD, but good enough that we could actually stream. I actually think of all of those factors being the reason why Meerkat, Periscope, Blab, FireTalk, MyEye, Facebook Live, Facebook Mentions, and other other nonsense, uh, you know, live streaming apps you want to throw in there. I think all of them have Netflix to thank. And to me, that's not something you would have. I, I would have kind of like linked to it. So, Daniel, what are your thoughts? Because it's probably the first time you've heard me explain it that way. Because it that literally came to me based on what we were just yeah, talking well, about before the show. It, the first thing that came to my mind was sitting at uh, the IBM. I think it was Partner World when they had Kevin Spacey come and speak, and 
you know, I can't take all the credit for it, but I've used uh, pieces of what he said in a number of keynotes I've done this last year about content consumption. And when he talks about the story about why he brought House of Cards to Netflix instead of taking it to the networks. And he talked about the power of control, right? About his user experience and being able to control his experience as the producer and the creator of the show. And then he talked about the power of control for the consumer, wanting to consume the content when they wanted it, where they wanted it, how they wanted it. And then in the future, you know, giving it the, you know, having the uh, creative control as well to let this show evolve in a way that had more than two episodes of a lifespan. Because he talked about how, you know, on a, uh, mainstream television channel, they pilot it and they give you maybe two or three episodes. And if the show doesn't take off, it gets killed. And he knew that the show had a, a bigger story to tell, a longer story to tell. And he didn't want the chance of it failing based on traditional content delivery and approval methods. So that was such a great story and so innovative because this was, you know, in the very, very beginning of 2015, he was talking about this story and he was doing this, what, two and three years before was when he was actually seeing this. So you can see what the innovators of content were actually thinking about was years ahead of what we, as many of the, us as consumers were thinking about. And therefore, thank goodness, Netflix, and people like Spacey actually understood where the model, where the consumption model was going. Because I have no doubt in my mind that we've entered a world where we don't want to wait for anything. There's nothing left to wait for. Um, it's the holiday, right? And I know I don't want to skip from the year in review from the very beginning to the very end. But how many people can realistically say that their entire Christmas shopping took place online over the last 30 days with stuff being delivered to doorsteps um, or through an email? I mean... Like two and three years ago with our customers, we used to have to go to like a Harry and David's and go online and, and place an order and ship stuff and get everybody's addresses. Now we send things through email, claim your gift, get your gift, you know, whether you want a gift certificate to Lush or to Amazon or, or for wine. I mean, we can get people anything. So I just think we've really come to this kind of on demand economy and it's happening with both the content we consume and just the way we live. There is no such thing, Brian, as waiting anymore for anything. We want what we want and we want it now. Well, you know what? I love the House of Cards example because not only is it not about waiting, but let's, you know, for those of you that don't know the whole story, and, and maybe we'll throw the um, the actual link in the show notes, but I love the House of Cards story and the fact of, do you know how much data was used to determine that show? They actually figured out <laughs> using the data on Netflix data, how much sex should be integrated in that show. They figured out, what what should it be a uh, old care you know an older uh, main character or a younger main character? How how much killing should be in the show? How much political corruption should be in the show? Is political corruption just as important? The fact that we're we're now looking at you know let's let's get I I love to bash on TV and billboards and I think it's probably getting my soapbox of 2016 because I said like you know we had Nielsen ratings and we had all this nonsense that was like some you know if you're if you had the lucky TV box that had like the chip in it and if you left your TV on that meant you were watching shows and all this crazy stuff that I don't really understand and I'm and I'm not a big fan of bashing what I don't understand but I will and I think an exception in this case where. I think Netflix decided, you know, early on when you know we we talked about this. The reason they put Blockbuster out of business is they weren't shipping you DVDs. They were figuring out what the hell you like, and then they were going to serve it to you. And it goes beyond just putting it as a targeted ad, like an Amazon. Right? We're now giving you the data. We're we're creating a show. I mean, I mean, I see the comments here. Those of you that are listening to this only on iTunes or Stitcher or one of our shows, you know, um, we have comments, live comments. We have live audience watching the show, and you know, lots of people talking about. Amazon Prime and, and this new idea of how you consume and, and streaming media. Well, you know, if you would have asked, you know, I remember, you know, Daniel, you and I were in, Mar in Barcelona, Spain, the end of February, and we were doing video recordings. You and I were doing video blogs and Meerkat came out and I, and I turned my, told my aha story. And then I went to South by Southwest and Meerkat put me on a map that I didn't expect to be on. Um, not only did it just drop in my lap, but all of a sudden I was on a leaderboard with the likes of Gary Vaynerchuk and Jimmy Fallon um, and Ashton Kutcher and um, doing this live streaming thing. And, and now we're built a business around it. We probably will, um, you know, I, I believe we'll have the largest um, live streaming event that you and I will participate in um, and actually are running in 2016 that maybe we'll add that to a little tease in our, in our, on our next episode. But one of the things to me that is still crazy is that we now have the power in our phones to consume the content we want with Netflix, to read and engage with the world via social media, 
but we also now have the ability to stand out from the noise and share our stories and our experiences with the click of one button, no matter which app you want to use. I don't care about the apps anymore. Like, I mean, you will, you will see a, a big shift in my content and my language, not talking about Meerkat and Periscope, not talking about Facebook Live, talking about this idea of digital storytelling and using whatever app it is. And, and maybe it's Snapchat. Maybe it's even YouTube Capture and you're doing it um, via that. Maybe it's Blab, what we're doing here. I mean, Daniel, you and I talked about it. We run a show every single Thursday. So for those that are listening, you're like, wait, these guys aren't very consistent. They haven't been around uh, in the last couple of weeks. Well, we do run a show every single Thursday and we don't miss an app, but that show is not a show that we miss. You know, it's, it's, uh, every, it's one hour every Thursday. Thursday at noon Eastern time. It's not going away in 2016, but something that in that show, if we didn't have blab because blab has a mobile aspect to it, we would, we would have missed, I would guess eight to 10 shows that of, of this year because Google Hangouts does not, because for some reason, Google forgot, you know, it's not like they own a company like Android. They just forgot that like people want to consume and participate in their video content on their mobile device. And I'm also the guy who wrote a, the, the, blog post that said, goodbye, Google Hangouts, hello, Blab. So I'm a little bit biased on the on the Blab side of the show. But what I really wanted to kind of focus on for me, 2015 is the year of the power of the mobile device. Not the year of the mobile device. We've had iPhones for plenty long. But the power that we now hold in our mobile device to tell the world, to engage with the world. And I mean, Daniel, you and I both, I mean, the a lot of the speaking gigs that we have, we were, we were booking in 2016, they're, they're because people are seeing us, that uh, our content we've created on our mobile devices. We're getting paid a, a lot of money to go speak at a, a lot of events around the world. I mean, w- would you have thought that in the beginning of 2015? No, I mean, there's no way that starting the year, the way we had to create content, think about it. In Spain, when Meerkat came out, we were still creating content. We had to connect to our computers, be online, uh, run our Google Hangouts, you know, have a camera set up, have our uh, podcasting mic set up. And granted, you know, quality is still can be important but what started happening was this really kind of authentic real-time storytelling that could go on that people love and i guess you could have predicted it i mean real world uh american idol you know all these real reality tv shows that have taken off and that people have become obsessed with the ability to con- connect to things that they think are real and even though some of that has evolved to be less and less real you come to find out people like raw and authentic they you know we are kind of voyeurs in life we like to see what's going on in other people's lives, windows in other people's lives. That's why social media has been so uh, popular as a whole. And now all of a sudden it brought a whole new aspect. Instead of us sharing our thoughts in 140 characters or 700 words or in a post on Facebook, we can just jump on and start live streaming. And we can talk to people for five minutes, probably produce more depth and uh, emotional connection to your audience than you would be able to connect with uh, two and 3,000 word blog posts. And you would be able to do it instantly. And then you also have that asset forever. And that's so cool is, you know, think about like creating a speaker reel, Brian. Like, you know, I created a a real sizzle reel and I I went through that whole thing. You created a sizzle reel on Periscope. You literally started to talk to people and people just started coming and said, Brian, we want to have you come speak. We love what you have to say. 10 years ago, not possible. 10 years ago, you needed a studio. You needed multiple cameras. You needed a green screen. You needed a script. I can't believe how far we've come in the ability for a brand or an individual or both, because we really are both now. We are brands and individuals to get out there and quickly tell our story online in the channel where our audience is, which means if it's here, if it's LinkedIn, if it's Periscope, you tell them what you want, where you want it, how you want it. And Brian, I think that's an extremely powerful thing. And for 2015, that may very well be the biggest impact that will be left behind into the future and it's being impacted by cloud mobile social big data all the things that smack is all about is powering this trend but this real is people talking to people and i love that you brought that up let's 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 be real for a second here live streaming app meerkat came out in late february uh periscope came out in late march those do not exist without the four letters that are the title of our show smack talk social the reason they are they, they are better they, the reason they did a better job than you now you stream live stream hang with a lot of these technologies that came out in 2014 that were doing very similar thing is they had a very social aspect to them right they, the the other aspect that they are really great is they understand the mobile device people always ask me brian you're not even using headphones when you're using periscope no because 
Periscope built that app knowing the hardware that existed in the iPhone 6. So they knew what microphones were, how to amplify the microphones, where those things went in there. Analytics. Analytics, when you get on the show, the reason that they have a ticker, they tell you how many people are live and how many people can comment and all of this information when you get off, you can even get a retention rate and where people are living because that data matters to a broadcaster. And then cloud, let's be real. Cloud is the accelerator, the reason that we're able to scale. You know, if you're telling me a, a company like Meerkat would have had to buy the, the amount of servers that they would have needed to not have a cloud-based solution and then release that at, at South by Southwest. I mean, South by Southwest, we, we were joking for a long time. Even when I was going there, I was like, there's no way Meerkat is going to pull a Twitter or a Foursquare. Because you know we haven't seen a South by Southwest where one app has taken over or one technology has taken over really probably since Foursquare. Foursquare was probably the last one before Meerkat. But the reason Meerkat did is because it was keep it simple, stupid. And the only reason keep it simple, stupid existed is because of Smack. Because Smack allowed Meerkat to be something that was keep it simple, stupid that I don't believe everything else could have done. And actually, we have someone here dropping in. Uh, I love it that um, dropping in one of my favorite stats. So Cisco does have the stat where 69% of consumer online traffic in the next two years will be video. It's in my keynote. It's been my keynote that I've been giving. Um, and actually, I got a note from Cisco via SlideShare telling me that that number is now increased. And they're going to get me some new data on that. So Daniel, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up the, the year in review that was 2015, now we're going to do another show. Our next episode is going to be the preview of 2016. Um, I do know one of my favorite people, and actually I met her via Meerkat, um, and it's The Malia on Twitter. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about is live streaming became a popular term. I think we're, we're, live streaming is still probably the wrong – live streaming might be like cloud where people looked at cloud as like, oh yeah, iCloud, that's where my photos live. Or cloud, yeah, that's the box or Dropbox. And you're like, oh no, cloud is a million times more than that. It's the reason Amazon is crushing everything. It's the reason Walmart is able to get you prices so low and, and the, the things that you want. But another thing that's really came mainstream, especially in the second half of 2016, and the Malia, if you want to hit jump in the seat here, I, I'm not an expert in this space, but I would love to get your thoughts on here as we wrap up to 2015. AV or AR, I'm sorry, um, augmented reality and virtual reality, I think are now topics that went from, I mean, who would have thought? I mean, Internet of Things was really confusing a year ago. There is no way I would have thought AR and, and or uh, I'll keep to augmented reality and virtual reality would be kind of part of our conversation. But the Malia said she's going to give us a rain check. She's probably consuming this on her mobile device, although she has the greatest smile in live streaming. She's always great on the show. But, you know, I actually think, you know, what are your thoughts, Daniel, I think, on Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, and then this new maybe buzz where it's VR and AR, and I agree with some of the people in the comments, they are going to come back into the mainstream in 2016. Well, I think you, you, you opened up the perfect gate for what will become the start of our Future Ready 2016 show that we will do next. But I think that augmented reality, virtual reality, Internet of Things have all been popular topics this year. However, in the grand scheme of where we, we got into storytelling and we got into uh, mobility as kind of the hot 2015 topics, I think these are going to become more 2016 and beyond. I still think that we're living a little bit in the, uh, the geeky world here talking about AR and VR as things that are going to widely impact business, but there's no question that they're going to. The question mark for me is, is it 2016? Is that where it really starts? Is that where it becomes a, these become mainstream topics in, will they be as popular as Periscope next year? Or are we still a few years out? Um, my prediction is internet of things 2016. It's going to be explosive as something that's going to become part of our everyday lives and everyday businesses. Um, so I don't want to give away the whole, the, the, the whole future show that we're about to do right now, Brian, but I would say that the real thing that you, you and I nailed in the 2015 years of smack talk is that it was the year of smack. It was the year that social mobile data cloud came together to become more transparent, less technical and more useful in the way that people communicated and brands were able to engage their consumers.
No, I love it. You're right. And, uh, you know, we, we bring the smack. We're going to bring it on a more frequent basis, a more consistent basis in 2016. But, you know, one of my examples, and I think this is kind of how I want to kind of pull together um, the year for me in 2015. You know, we do a lot of work with IBM. IBM sponsors one of our other shows. We do also do a lot of work with SAP. And I think of IBM, you know, we've had a lot of people come to me uh, and really us in, as a whole and say, you know, like, I didn't realize what IBM did. And these are millennials, most of them. Um, until you guys started working with IBM, right? And um, IBM is big blue. You know, I remember growing up thinking of IBM as mainframes and a bunch of guys, probably um, old white guys in blue suits, right? And like they were, they were, they were clean and proper. They were, they were running the world of doing stuff that we didn't really know what they were doing, but we knew they were big blue. And I started working with them, you know, three years ago. And then the more work we started doing with them, but I, you know, I presented at an event early in this year um, at at an IBM event, and it was before live streaming. It was before um, a lot of the tech that we were talking about. And my, the title of my topic was how to tell your story in 140 characters. And really, it was about storytelling and the ability to really build your personal brand. It was tailored towards developers and the importance, I believe, in your digital footprint being your first impression, your resume, your reputation. And that was in February of 2015. Fast forward to the last IBM event I went to a month ago or so, where I was at an IBM event again. This time I was paid to come there to actually live stream the event, to actually tell the story. There was 12,000 people there, but I was actually live streaming from the IBM Twitter handle to another 1,400 people who were able to ask questions at the event that was going on in Las Vegas. So for me, putting this in perspective, the change, 2015 was the year of technology change all thanks, in my belief, to our mobile device. I think our mobile device now, and I think it's actually a tease for me in 2016, is our mobile device went from an endpoint to an actionable point. And what I mean by that is we all used our mobile device and said, this is cool. We can get our phone calls everywhere. Well, now I don't even know where my phone call button is on my phone because I don't even use it for talking on the phone. I mean, why would I do that when I can do about a thousand other things on my phone? But I actually think our mobile device now is not only can I engage with the world on social media, I can live stream with the world if I want to do it via video. You know, um, you know one of my favorite apps in, in, in 2015 didn't really change that much. It just became much more useful for me was Slack because Slack now, you know, so many more people are engaged and Slack requires a lot of attention. And if you're able to have it on your mobile device, it's, it's powerful. And the reason that Slack is great is it, in, it integrates with your mobility. And I think that's actually my favorite show that we did, Daniel, of the year. Um, and maybe that's a different show. We're gonna, we'll go back and listen to a couple of our shows. But I love the show where we broke down the difference between mobile and mobility. And the fact that so many are kind of thinking about that differently. So for me, that's actually probably, that'll be my uh, end here. I'll kind of put a bow on this. Um, the end for me, the 2015 was the year everyone, everything, every app went from, hey, we have mobile and we can use it to we're going to start leveraging the features that exist for mobility. So you wrap it up on your side and then we'll jump off here. And remember, next episode for you guys that are listening on the on the uh, the podcast audio version, we will be doing 2016 preview. So you're not missing out on you're like, wait a second. All these guys did is talk about stuff I already know. But go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, put, a, put a bow on 2015. Yeah, we're going to break it up into, into two pieces. So that way we can do two shows, two productions. This is also the year of bite-sized content, right, Brian? where we're creating snackable as our friend Mark Schaefer, I think quoted, I think he's the guy I got to give yep. credit to, but uh, you know, I think, I think Brian, you, you did really say it well. I think it's the year where mobile went from, you said an end point to a, uh, to something. And I, I was thinking an end point to a center point, our entire life. It's like the centerpiece of our life is our mobile device. Now uh, for good and for bad, it's kind of a, it's exciting. And it's also scary. You remember that great uh, artist imagery where he took the phones out of people's hands and showed us in real life. And, I think that, you know, I came out of this year thinking I'm more connected to more people in more places at any time with more flexibility than I've ever been before. And I love everything about that. And it's all entirely powered by technology. But I never think about technology when I'm using any of these tools. I just think about the content and the story that I'm telling. And I think that's that's what's amazing. I was talking to my wife this morning a little bit about a worldview. And I said, you know, I think part of the reason we have and not to go into too much into politics, because this has been a year of politics, undoubtedly, but that we had a year where, um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of people not being able to agree and online has been uh, almost fostering that negativity. But I think online also allows us to connect to more people in more places around the world than ever before. 
Brian, us being able to get out and travel the world has been amazing, but also us just talking to people from around the world every day, the people that are here on this show right now has given us so much visibility into the fact that we aren't so, it isn't so ethnocentric. Uh, Chicago, Illinois for me and, and Virginia for you is not the center of the universe. There are many people in many places that have many different beliefs and ideas about the world. And I think the technology, that's the next gap is the chance of it helping us, it, it being a positive light in bringing more peace and more uh, positive relationships to the world is here today. And I think that's what I'm hoping to see as we roll into our 2016 episodes that technology's use for social and business good can become. I love it. I love it. I love it. I mean, I, I mean, how awesome is that? I mean, I, I walk the streets the day after the 20, the, the Paris attacks, I walk the streets. Imagine if we had live streaming when September 11th happened. Like, I mean, I, I thought I was crying my eyes out walking the streets of Paris after that horrible tragedy because someone that was there, a, a friend, you know, a shout out to, you know, uh, a couple of the people that were on Periscope that were doing it so, so, you know, doing it as a tribute. And, you know, I think I remember, Daniel, you, you know, I, I did my meerkat and, and this is kind of how I love to rap. I did the meerkat um, there in Barcelona. You know, you and I were both there. We were leaving the Dell booth. We, you were sitting in the Dell booth. I was, you were actually interviewing one of um, our friends, Patrick Moorhead was sitting there. I can, I can even picture the second that I downloaded meerkat after I got the text and I looked over at you and you're interviewing Patrick Moorhead. And I was like, well, I got a couple minutes. And the aha moment to me actually probably puts a good bow on this is I clicked that button. I went live and I had spent an hour already talking about my experience in Barcelona. And Daniel, you and I are really good at that. My aha moment came because one person in Indiana changed that, right? The comment that come up on my meerkat stream said, Brian, is that the new Samsung phone over there? Can you walk over there and show me, what's going on in that uh, over there in that booth. They, they were now in Indiana from a person from Virginia was helping curate and be a part of my content that I was creating in Barcelona, all on my mobile device over a cellular network or Wi-Fi network that ended up crashing two minutes after that person made that comment. Um, but to me, I love that you wrapped it up on this idea that I think now we're able to leverage technology to share our experiences. And if we start sharing more of the social good experiences, the bad and the hate that we've been used to on our news and, and kind of polluting our, our world. I will, I say we don't eliminate the hate. We just don't make that the focal point or the noise that is standing out. So Daniel, this has been a fun year. 2015 has been um, a lot of fun, a lot of craziness. We've had a lot of changes both in our business as well as our, our shows and our, on our uh, things that we've been talking about. But I think um, this has been something that is a lot of fun. So, um, you know, those of you that are tuning in, thank you so much. You know, we, we jumped in the podcasting, um, mainly because, you know, Daniel, and I like to talk, um, and we have faces for podcasting much more so than we have faces for, uh, TV. And we, we said, you know, I want to see what this is and, and podcasting blew my mind. And I know Daniel, you and I talked about this before, you know, like the audience that we had on podcasting, both of us have a pretty decent footprint in social media. We're not, um, you know, we're not hard to have access to. If you tweet at us, we'll pretty much tweet you back fairly easily, fairly regularly. But the podcasting community, being able to be in your ear, being able to be a part of your morning drive, your morning commute, being being something that's giving you the access to technology news that maybe you don't sit around all day like us um, embracing your FOMO, but the half hour or 40 minutes you're able to spend in the car or doing something has been able to you know, impact your life or your day. I mean, I, I, I thank you every person that has been listening, every person that's been sharing our broadcasts, every person, you know, every time Daniel and I would click on it, we'd go, do you see how many downloads are going on for this episode? And, you know, and a weird thing about podcasting and like, unlike a lot of our other stuff is we can really determine why. In podcasting, it's like, well, how, why did that episode all of a sudden go viral and it's our most popular episode when it was at IBM Partner World and we were talking to somebody that was doing tax collection, right? Like, uh, and if you don't understand that, go back and look at some of our episodes. But 2015, I just want to give a big shout out. Thank you to the community. Thank you for everybody that watches our shows live on Blab. Remember, you can go to millennialceo.com slash, not backslash, I've learned that in 2015. I say it wrong every time. Um, smack Talk. So millennialceo.com slash Smack Talk to get all of our other episodes or just use the hashtag Smack Talk on Twitter. And we'll, we, we, we engage off of that. We have, a, of course, a Twitter handle and all of those things. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for 2016 for a, numer uh, a ton of reasons. But 2015 was great. Uh, Daniel, thank you for joining me on this ride. And thank you for all those that are out there listening and enjoying the show.
The ride's going to be great ahead. And we thank everybody. The community is what makes all of this possible. So we'll see you here maybe in just a few moments, maybe in a few hours, maybe in a few weeks when you listen to our 2016 preview show, which will be recorded starting right now. Now. <laughs>